Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series after our two-year hiatus. This episode is titled May Offshore Playbook. We're going to be speaking with longtime friend Captain Rick Croson of Living Waters Guide Service out of Wrightsville Beach, and he's going to be covering such areas as what to bring, what targets to look for, specifics on rigs for trolling, for jigging, for popping, and for bottom fishing. My name is Gary Hurley, Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post, and Fisherman's Post has been serving the NC saltwater fishing community since 2003. We've been offering fishing reports, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, membership weekly reports, and now the popular saltwater podcast series where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insights, their knowledge on how to catch more fish more often. And I am joined in this endeavor, Saltwater Podcast Series version 2.0, with a new podcast partner, first time sans Billy Thorpe. Please welcome David Harden of Harden Creative Media. Hello, Gary. <laughs> Hello, David. How are you doing? I'm doing good, it's man. Good. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Man, it's a pleasure to have you in that seat. It's a pleasure to be back at the podcast studio. It's a pleasure to be talking with Rick Croson. I'm very thankful. I'm very grateful in this moment. It's exciting. I'm excited to talk fishing. I can tell. I can tell you're excited. I could, I'm physically, you know, just excited. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of fish. If you want to talk fishing, our guest is the perfect guest. He can talk fishing. All right. All right I'm, I'm, I'll be ready. All right. So we have some sponsors to thank, don't we? I hope we have some sponsors to thank. Uh, the first one is uh, Port City Signs. Port City Signs and Graphics. Man, I, I love those people. It's Sabrina and crew. And uh, welcoming them to the podcast. I mean, I've had a relationship with her for just about all 20 years. If it, well, I won't say that because they haven't been around 20 years. But we'll say over 10, maybe less than 15. Man, they do so much for us. They do our leaderboard logos. They do all our banners. They do so much work. And what I'm excited about this sponsorship is I get to tell the world that they do so much more. David, I think you got a slide showing us one example. So... Here's our theme, David. They do so much different design work, so much different sign work that every episode they sponsor, we're going to showcase a different service, a different product they provide. That's good. I know uh, Sabrina as well. I've worked with her uh, for years, and they do really, really sharp work at that shop. Yeah, man. So we were just looking at a vehicle wrap. They do vehicle wraps. Of course, they do boat wraps. We're going to be talking about boat wraps soon because they're going to do probably boats that belong to a couple of people that you might know. But today, again, what I'm just trying to brand is so many different products and services. Vehicle Wrap is one of them. That's great. And we've got another sponsor. And who's that? That would be Marine Warehouse Center. I couldn't imagine doing this podcast without Marine it Warehouse Center. It wouldn't be Center. the same. It wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't. With, uh, with uh, plenty of terrible jokes. Well, let's see a video first. Okay, let's watch a video. Matt with Marine Warehouse, excited to give you guys a huge update. We're now carrying Seaborne and Spider Boat Line. Of course, we have the newest models of Carolina Skiff, Sailfish, Sea Chaser, and Pan Marine. With over 60 boats in stock at a Wilmington location, let's schedule a sea trial and let's get you on the water today. Good people at Marine Warehouse. They are fantastic people, Emmett Terrell and the whole crew, and Last episode, you introduced us that you have a relationship with them. They helped you with the repower. And this episode, I think you're going to tell us about yet another service they provided. Another. My uh, my trailer was replaced by Marine Warehouse, and they did such a great job for it. They, they custom fit it to my boat, so it's perfectly balanced going down the road. Um, they did a fantastic job with it. Well, sales, parts, and service, they have it all. And... You know, as we as we reintroduce with our first episode again here, when we're in our second episode, Terrell, as soon as the podcast resurfaced, man, that guy is just he just wants attention. He's blowing up my phone. Uh, he has yet another joke for me to tell. Another one. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're calling these jokes. We're still going to call these <laughs> jokes. Technically, so, technically. So this time, Terrell called me, and you know, of course, it was during dinner hour. I'm trying to have some family time, but I answer because it's Terrell, and he tells me that he's working on a book. He's writing a book on reverse psychology, but he told me not to buy it. 
That was a good one. <laughs> was it? That was a good one. Yeah, that was a good one. Was it? If we had sound effects, <laughs> there would have been a rim shot sound effect in there. Was it though? We can, maybe we can put that in later. Um, how to sponsor the show? Uh, yeah, uh, let us know if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast. Uh, we'd love to work with you. So just uh, contact Fisherman's Post. Yeah, information on fishermanspost.com. Click on the podcast tab and a new announcement. So we're doing something different with the return of the podcast. Um, many of you know that we've been offering these weekly fishing reports behind a paid wall. Fisherman's Post has weekly inshore fishing reports up and down the North Carolina coast behind a paid wall. We are going to incorporate the podcast into member benefits. We want to reward, we're very grateful for our members. We're going to give them more for their membership dollar. So now weekly inshore fishing report members will get early releases of podcasts. So they'll be watching this Rick Croson podcast earlier. They'll be seeing the Pierre again, a podcast earlier. And in addition to early release of the podcast, you'll also get bonus content. So what we're going to do after each show is David Harden's coming up with his own questions. We're going to have five to 10 minutes of bonus content, not available on YouTube, but available again as a thank you to our members. And if you want information on that, it's fishermanspost.com and then click on premium content or memberships. That's great. It's all good stuff. We ready to go? Um, we're almost ready to go. What I have to do is what I do is I set up the end of the show here at the beginning of the show. Oh, okay. And setting up the end of the show means we're going to come to you, not for Billy's best takeaway, but we're coming to you for David's best takeaway. David's best A takeaway. brilliant name. And we're going to see if you have any what about questions. We're going to see if David asked, you know, if he were the host, what questions would he have asked? Rick Croson. And again, that'll be our jump start for our bonus content behind the membership paid wall. But right now, yes, David Harden, it is my pleasure, my privilege to welcome back to the podcast. And I didn't check this beforehand, but I believe for a fourth time, that might be worthy of a jacket or something. Captain Rick Croson, Living Waters Guide Service out of Wrightsville Beach. Welcome back to the podcast. Hey, thank you so much, Gary, for having me. Yeah, man. Again, as I've told people all the time, man, one of the first people I talked to when I was just fleshing out the idea of Fisherman's Post newspaper back in 2003. And so do you know how many times you've been on the pot? This isn't one of your two questions. I'm just asking out of curiosity. I, I don't. I think this is number four or five. Yeah. I think so too. All right. Well, you've been on the show enough to know that we don't get to the material until we do our two questions. You tell me you're ready for question number one. I give you question number one. Okay. First of all, Going back to the Marine Warehouse piece you just did, Marine Warehouse, um, they do everything for me. Just like David said on his trailer, they work on my trailer, they work on my motors, they do all of my, if the mechanic touches it, it's through them. So just a big giant plug to them, the the best sponsor you could have. Man, I had to give Pierre 50 bucks last week, and now this week I'm giving Rick Croson 50 bucks for that spontaneous plug of our sponsor. Unprompted. Rick Croson, question number one. Mm -hmm. Why should we listen to what you have to say about offshore fishing? Mm. As a Gen Xer, I'm not sure that you should, except for when I get home at the end of the day, I'd have to clean fish for multiple minutes or sometimes longer than minutes. So um, I would listen to me only because I love to fish and I love to take advantage of everything that's available. And so uh, this is not the only way to do it, but it's my way to do it. So that's why I'd listen. The acceptable answer to number two, you qualify for question number two. Are you ready, sir? Okay, go ahead. From the following list, which of these celebrities are advocates of the keto diet, a diet of which you participated in for a few years? Which of the following are advocates of the keto diet? I'm going to give you four names. Tell me which is, all right? Okay. Melissa McCarthy. I think it's bridesmaid fame. Tim Tebow. LeBron James. Kim Kardashian. Uh, Tim Tebow. Um, it's a trick question. They all are. All four of them are advocates of the keto diet. How about that? How about that company you used to keep? Interesting. Yes. Now I'm carnivore. So <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Let's get into May offshore playbook. I think our first thing is what to bring. But I tell you what, before we even go to what to bring, give us the thought process behind that title, the May offshore playbook. Yeah. Great question, Gary. So <clears throat> when you asked me about, you know, hey, what, you know, what can we talk about? This is coming out in May. Um, 
May to me is just a, it's a prime month for where we are in North Carolina. Uh, we're at the perfect latitude for having so many different uh, targets, um, which is a great thing. It's also, um, it also complicates things. Um, so the reason I said playbook is because I, this time of year, I go offshore with the most amount of gear that I, that I have um, because we have such changing conditions um, and it can change overnight. Um, and we have so many different targets. And so you can get offshore and, and see something that you're just not prepared for at any second. And so hopefully this will get you uh, more in line with being able to go offshore and, and nothing sneak up on you, um, uh, give you the best chance to bring home the most amount of fish. I like it. I like I I like May uh, offshore fishing, and I'm curious. I've been with you on the boat when it looks like we're armed for bear, and sure enough, man, you know, so many of those rods or rigs come into play. So move us in, man. What are we? What is it that you like to bring? What is it that you like to load the boat down with? So unfortunately, I bring I bring four main things, and so most people are going to go to the Gulf Stream. And so, okay, <clears throat> again, this is from the break into the deep water. So, um, roughly 60 miles offshore. Um, I'm talking anywhere from hundred and generally 140 foot to 400 foot of water on the break. Um, if we have to get into the deep water, um, chasing mahis or billfish, um, that may be a little different, but consider everything I'm talking about on the break itself. Okay. Um, so I'm bringing four different types of, of tackle, uh, trolling tackle, jigging tackle, popping tackle, and bottom fishing tackle. And most people are gonna go out there and expect to troll. Um, that's what I see the you know, predominant. Um, I always take jigging and popping tackle, even if I'm going Spanish mackerel fishing, I have jigging and popping tackle. Um, I just love to do it. Um, and then the bottom tackle, because May 1st is when our grouper season starts, um, I have to bring an extra layer of stuff that this time of year, I don't, I don't really bring a, a, a big, that's not a big part of what I bring. But from May 1st on, it is. Um, and I'm going to kind of break down um, what we're going to target with all those and then some tricks on on how to be set up for each one of those. Um, so starting off with trolling, um, the, the biggest targets or the most sought after targets in May are going to be wahoo tunas which could be black fins or yellow fins here depending on the on the year sometimes we get yellow fins sometimes we don't um mahis and sailfish now there are also good numbers of blue marlin um and there's other targets out there but those are the big four um and then for jigging we're going to be targeting primarily tuna amberjacks african pompanos and then assorted bottom fish and then with the popping gear, we're going to be primarily looking for tunas and mahi. And then the bottom tackle obviously will be all your grouper, snapper, trigger fish, um, all that kind of stuff. All your tasty critters that live on the bottom. I follow, I follow that list. And I mean, I'm trying to keep up. I'm trying to remember. I mean, like you said, there's so many options. I'm trying to keep up with that list so that I can refer to it as we move into the show. But I think you know, I guess I'm thinking what other people are thinking, like, all right, that's an impressive list. Where do you start? I guess as in, you know, you might have a vision. I mean, when you leave the inlet, do you have a plan in mind? Like I'm going to start doing this or is that not determined until you get out to 120, 140 feet of water? And then you make a decision based on what you see once you're out there. Okay. So that's a great question. Um, typically, like I said, 90% of people are going to go out there to, to troll and, and primarily troll. So that's going to be the top of my list too. And the reason I say that even for me that I may go for, you know, a long stretch of days where I know what's been going on and what's happening. I always try to start off trolling to see what what's changed during the night. Um, this time of year, we have the most influx of water, meaning that the temperature gradients change. Um, the wind is pushing in different, uh, bait. So the bait could change from um, sardines and mackerels to flying fish. Um, the, you know, the squid are starting to move north as it warms up. Um, so there's tons and tons of stuff changing all the time. So I normally start off trolling. Um, and as far as like where I would start, 
Um, I kind of preach this in North Carolina. If you're looking for meat fish, I'm going to some sort of bottom structure and I'm going to head there and I'm going to look and use all my senses, my eyes, my nose, um, to find structure along the way that may be floating. So like lines or temperature breaks or, um, a ball of bait with birds on it or, or porpoises on it. Um, but traditionally I'm going to go to some sort of bottom structure, um, between 140 and, and 400 foot somewhere between the first and second break. Um, I may not stay where I start, but that, that if, if I'm going to tell you to go offshore and look for fish, it's going to be on structure to start with. Does that make sense? I'll use this sort of pause as a chance to ask you this question because I'm, I'm again, I imagine some people have it. Like if I'm going near shore fishing, I think of structure, I might think of something like the Liberty ship, but when as bottom structure, but when you're talking about 140 to 400 feet and bottom structure, what is it that you're referencing? It's the same, it's the same bottom structure that you would think of from zero to 30. Um, there are big pieces of structure up and down the continental shelf, um, known places like the steeples, the same old, um the big rock you know these are big places and then there are tons of smaller rocks um mixed in those depths between 140 and, and 400 foot and then the actual roll of the continental shelf itself so where you start to see the roll is where it goes from 150 that rolls to 225 and then it kind of plateaus for a little bit and then it rolls from 225 to say 350 that's the second roll and so we actually fish the rolls and we fish those rock structures such as like the same old or steeples. I follow that. Okay. Okay. Good deal. All right. So in the spring, especially in May, because we have so many targets, when I start off with trolling stuff in my mind, I'm going to have wire rigged. Um, I like single strand, either single strand uh, stainless wire or piano wire, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, and these are going to be for Ballyhoo rigs um smalls and mediums um with a sea witch or without um this time of year i use more naked ballyhoos than i do any other time of the year um and the reason i do that is because um i can always slide a skirt down on the way i rig my baits because i have a real small loop at the end so if i needed to during the day if i found that that, that pink is you know the color that they're keying on i can take my naked and slide a pink skirt down on it um, but in general, there are so many targets out there that naked ballyhoos just target everything. They don't, you know, um, uh, tuna is going to eat it. Omahi's going to eat it. Oahu's going to eat it. Everything's going to eat it. And I don't have to worry that, um, that, you know, I have uh, blue and white out there or, or whatever. Um, naked is, is really, really effective this time of year. Um, but again, wire, because the wahoos are still there. Uh, we have wahoos all winter. We have wahoos all the time, but um, this time of year, it, it could be a, the, the wahoos could, you could totally crush them at any time during May. Um, so definitely have wire. Um, I may also have some fluorocarbon or mono rigs um, in the boat ready to, to be rigged. And the only really reason I would change to mono is if I left the break and let's say that the water on the break is green or for some reason the water is messed up or there's no activity and i and i want to go offshore and look for a, a weed line or a color change or a temperature break once i get past 400 foot of water i don't feel like i'm going to be around a lot of wahoos i feel like that's primarily uh mahis uh possibly yellow fins sailfish white marlin blue marlin that kind of thing so once i cross that threshold of of say 400 feet, then I'm going mono or fluorocarbon and, and I'm not so much worried about losing uh, fish uh, to cutoffs um, just because there's not as many wahoos once you get past the break. Yeah. Um, I, f I, you know, you anticipated my question. I was thinking, you know, from what I've heard is if you make a wire decision, you know, there's benefits and there's negatives to it, but I like the answer. Like, the benefits far outweigh the negatives short of 400 feet. And then the math just becomes different when you're further away from Wahoo territory. 
That's correct. And and so the, the, the biggest problem is when you're on the break in May, if you get a Wahoo bite on a mono rig or a fluorocarbon rig, there's a 99% chance you're going to miss that fish. And if you get two or three Wahoo bites, having two or three Wahoos is a big deal. A tuna fish will still eat the wire. I've caught plenty of tunas, yellow fins and black fins on wire. They, they, they're not as picky here as they are, say, once you get to like Oregon Inlet, where it's a completely different fishery. Uh, up there, it is a, it's a different deal. Um, but for here, we're fishing, we're fishing structure, we're fishing bait, we're fishing. Um, we could have king mackerels mixed in, or and obviously tons of barracudas, especially in that 140 to 225 range. So there's all kinds of things out there that are going to have teeth that will cut you off. Um, so for me, again, this is just the way I do it. You, this is not gospel, and you don't, you know, don't tell all your friends that you have to do it this way. But for me, this is this is what I I plan to do: is wire on the break. If I get past the wire, go with fluorocarbon or mono. It's just easier to deal with because the wire, you know, wires wire. It's 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 um it doesn't drop back very well. So if you're trying to catch a sailfish that's beating the bait up and you need to drop back it's a little bit harder to catch him because it doesn't drop back smooth you know you have a, a piece of wire that doesn't just kind of collapse it it folds over and drags in the water um hey i gotta before you move on so the question that just came to mind and you might have just hit on it there at the end would be what fit you know if you've caught tunas you caught mahi but what species of fish have you found in our fishery not the hatteras fishery that are the most wire shy where wire does affect the bite the most. Um, honestly, in our fishery, I, I, I haven't found, I mean, I guess yellow fins would, would still be the answer, but when we catch yellow fins in May, they're so hungry, they don't care. And, and typically um, they're mixed in with all the other things. So you could have a yellow fin, a wahoo and a mahi on at the same time. It, it, I've done that multiple times in the past um that's why our fishery is so um it's great it's also <laughs> frustrating because you have to be prepared for all that stuff um and so yeah if, if yellow fins like if you saw yellow fins while you were there and that's when the popping rods and the jigging rods would come into effect before i changed my trolling spread but the, if you were going to troll only that's when i would go okay um i need to switch to fluorocarbon on a few more rigs so that if I'm not catching them on the wire, maybe that'll give me a chance to catch them. Okay. I, fo I follow that mentality. Okay. And I don't know where you were headed. I don't know if we're, are we, are we're we wrapping trolling. up? The, we're still trolling. Okay. Still can, trolling. Carry on. Okay. So uh, the, another great thing about this time of year is we have all these different species. Another horrible thing about this time of year is we have all these other species. <laughs> so um, before the water inshore warms up where all of your, um, your what we can we consider near shore predators move in like your king mackerels like your false albacores um they're still on the break okay so um i, I have gone through so many ballyhoos in the day that it's just not even funny and um ballyhoos are not going down in price they're 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 expensive um and typically you catch a uh, or get a bite off a king mackerel especially if you if you catch a king mackerel or catch a, a false albacore or god forbid the hound fish show up which are those long gars um or uh we have uh right now there's a bunch of little baby i uh, say baby like three foot long you know 20 pound uh, spinner sharks offshore they're all just waiting for the water to get warm enough so they can come in so another tip for going offshore in may is to have a bunch of alternative lures other than just ballyhoos um, and I just have a couple of examples. This is a, this is a little lure from Islander uh, designed to be run without bait. It's a octopus skirt on a traditional head. This is a bullet head. Um, I didn't have a chance to grab a bunch of stuff, but a lot of companies make small lures, um, meat fish lures. Um, Blue water candy has a bunch of small lures that are designed to be run by themselves with no bait. Um, uh, uh, cedar plugs been around forever green machines that kind of stuff have plenty of that stuff on hand um, there are days when you show up offshore and you could go through five dozen ballyhoos in an hour i've done it with trash fish 
and never have a real shot at catching something you want to bring home. So bring small lures, um, be ready to go with small lures and, um, and mix them in your spread. Um, and a lot of times what you'll find is when you show up on the break and you're, you're starting to learn what's going on and where you need to be and how you need to be fishing, um, you're dealing with all this trash and all this, you know, bycatch. Um, and so I don't want to necessarily start off with a whole bunch of values out there and just get annihilated right off the bat. So I'll always mix some lures in there and, uh, and find out where I need to be and, and then modify my spread. So like if I need to get away from those trash fish, I can put primarily lures out until I get away from them and find out where the fish I want to catch are and then mix my spread back in with some natural bait. Um, another thing is strip baits. Uh, all, all fall, I, I take my uh, albacores and fall, you know, false albacores you catch offshore or inshore or wherever, and I strip them up and I bring them along as strip baits. So if you feel like it has to be natural in the water and not just a lure, you can mix strip baits into your ballyhoo spread. <clears throat> but just make sure that you have enough stuff that when you're trolling along you're not wiped out by lunchtime and going you know what do i do next um so that's a big key uh, again that's a that's an early spring that's that's april may but really may um there can be tons and tons of bycatch that you just don't want to have um um, I, fo I, fo I follow. I just was t uh, tuning in to say, man, I'm, I like the strategy. I like having it. And if I have any question, I guess, that comes to mind, like I understand about trolling something to get out of undesirables before you get into desirables. But like if you're trolling Ballyhoo and you're not in undesirables, at what point, like how long before you say it's time to mix it up? Uh, well, for me, I always have lures in my spread. I, I, I trust lures. Uh, I've been making lures for 30 some years um i always have some lures in my spread and i have so like you know everybody's had a cedar plug a cedar plug is one of those tuna catching baits that you can put out there and forget about it you know it's working um and uh if there's tunas around you know you have a good shot at getting a bite i like to run it on my long rigger out of the way um natural color paint it white paint it silver you know whatever um, but that's just a great bait all around. Um, mahi's a weeded, wahi's a weeded, but that's a tuna fish and lure. So if, if I'm trying to maximize my catch and I have uh, more traditional wahoo stuff closer and, and mahi stuff maybe in the middle that's that's looking for those fish, I still have something out there that's fishing for tuna specifically and um, isn't going to get you know messed up by all the undesirables. Um, and, and this is another thing I want to add to this. Th this is, this is, these are spoons. Uh, again, I've been talking about cedar plugs and, and green machines and stuff. This is a number four Clark spoon. It's the biggest Clark spoon they make. Um, this is a three and a half drone spoon. Um, this is a, a one and a half drone spoon. These are sometimes these are the thing that will save your day. Um, I pull them on small planers, number three, number four, um, usually with a 50 foot hand line. Um, and uh, I have those kind of coiled up in the back. And I use those when, especially in the spring, if you're marking fish down the water column a little bit and you just don't seem to be getting bites on top very well, something may be messed up with that top layer of water. And, and it's taken years and years and years to go to look at water and go, okay, I feel like it's messed up today. Sometimes it's just beautiful, but there's a mid layer. If you talk to divers, you know, there'll be thermoclines in the column itself. And so if you're marking fish, say 50, 60, 80 feet down, 100 feet down, and you just can't seem to get them up to eat your spread on top, having a small planer and a spoon, um, you don't need a planer rod for it. You know, planer rods are great. I'm not saying anything about planer rods. I, I can already tell my... I'm going to get spam about he hates planer rods. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the general guy that goes out there can take a normal trolling rod with a number three, number four planer, 50 foot of 100 pound test leader and uh, a drone spoon and put it below that dirty water line and everything eats a drone spoon. Mahis, tunas, wahoos, kings, everything does. Um, and that'll just let you know that you're in the right area, but you have to get a bait down to them. Okay. Um, that'll kind of that'll kind of cut out the um i feel like i should be here i'm marking fish everything looks good i just can't get bit this might help you decide to stay 
and then try something else like jigging, which I'll talk about here in a second. But when you're trolling, this this just allows you one more piece of the puzzle to 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 align everything, to figure out how they're going to feed, what they're going to feed on. Um, it, just another way to get a clue on how to catch fish that day. All right. I mean, I get it. I like it. I'm a fan of a drone spoon, and I know you have a long history of using baitless lures with lots of success. I think, you know, and just so we have time to talk about everything, this might be my final thoughts on trolling and then let's move to yeah. the next, to the next option on any given day. Yeah, that's, that's all for trolling on, on this one. Basically um, I'm going to use trolling to go look. And so while I'm trolling, I'm staring at my bottom machine and I'm looking at those rocks and I'm looking at, I'm looking for bait. I'm looking for fish. I'm looking for, any kind any signs of life okay um this just happened the other day and i was talking about using all your senses as i'm trolling along and you're looking for birds and turtles and porpoises and all that kind of stuff to kind of give you an idea of, of if there's life around one thing you can use is your nose and this sounds so weird until you experience it but you're trolling along and all of a sudden you you get a whiff of something sweet or or it has a sweet but it's a you know fishy odor but it's sweet um look into the wind because obviously it's coming from upwind and look for the oil spot because um this happened just this past week troll along smelt something looked up 100 yards in front of me i saw a big oil sheen by the time i got there um the, the current had pushed it away from where the fish were so i had to circle back around and to find the fish but that gave me all the clue i needed to where to go find those fish uh, that day it was a, a pack of tunas eating sardines um, and the blood in or the oil from the blood of all those sardines after they're eating and, and destroying them, it floats to the top and actually leaves an oil sheen, which has a smell to it. So using all your senses is a big deal. So anyway, that's, that's my last thing about trolling. Um, for me, <laughs> question, Gary. No, man, I'm just, I'm just listening in. I'm, I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying the show. No, that's good. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is jigging because <clears throat> when I go offshore, I primarily, I think trolling to find, and then I think jigging or popping to catch. And for me, jigging is, um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a rifle versus a shotgun approach. So when I'm trolling, I have a shotgun approach. I have a big wide spread. I can put multiple things out that make multiple different action swimming actions and some are aggressive some are smooth some are deep um and once i get bit on that and find a place where there's fish i can take my rifle scope which is jigging and i can target exactly where those fish are so especially tunas in the spring yellow fins black fins um i can mark them on the machine at a certain spot on the rock okay Let's say I'm trolling over the steeples and on the up current side of the rock, I find a school of tunas. Every time I cross it, I get bit. Well, now I can take my jigging stuff and I can go target that exact school of fish, make a drift over them. As soon as I get past it, pull up, make another drift over it. All my anglers can fish in the fish the whole time. You're hooking fish, you're landing fish, you're pulling up. But the time between trolling over them, circling back around and trolling over them again it's cut in half or, or less with a jig. Um, jigging in the spring for me is pretty simple. There's basically two different jigs that I'm going to use the most. Long jigs for all your pelagics, tunas, wahoos, mahis, and they will all eat this. And then I use short jigs uh, for all my bottom critters and things like African pompanos. And so like this is a, a Roscoe jig. This is just a small uh, fat flutter jig. Um, if I am pelagic fishing, Again, tunas, wahoos, mahis, it's long jig. Um, 50 class jig and tackle. Um, and I am using my trolling time to find where I need to be jigging. And then it's usually speed jigging. Metered line is a big deal. So I can find the fish, drop it to their level, not below their level, and fish just those fish. Okay. Um, later in the day, if I want a bottom fish with jigs, then you hit the bottom. You don't take up any slack. You jig uh, hard, let the jig flutter back down as soon as it touches jig it again. That's your grouper, snappers, African pompanos, that kind of thing. Um, but so jigging for me, again, it, it's the rifle approach after I've used the shotgun. 
um, to find where I need to actually put the lure. Um, and then popping is kind of also the same thing. Popping is kind of a, it's a, it's, it's more of a shotgun approach than, than jigging because you're attracting stuff to the sound of the popper versus putting a lure that makes no sound or noise in their face. Um, there are times in the spring, especially when the first big herd of uh, flying fish show up that everything stops looking around and they, they only key in on flying fish. Um, and when that happens, trolling can be ineffective. Um, not necessarily for mahis and wahoos, but for tunas. Um, some days when the flying fish are there and those tunas are keyed in, that's all they want. And so that's when popping takes over the entire forefront. If I'm seeing tunas eat flying fish and I'm seeing flying fish take off and running uh, and, and I'm not getting bit consistently or aggressively on the, um, on the trolling stuff, I'm going to pretty much instantly go to popping. Um, popping is two different things. Um, Traditional poppers, big cup, looks like a flying fish, basically in the body, and then stick baits, which is a, a topwater floating bait, but it, it has a, a more aerodynamic face. So when you pull this one, it kind of slithers through the water and makes some ripples. This one, when you pop it, it actually makes a big popping noise, which emulates the sound of a flying fish landing. They have a big head. They kind of land non-gracefully i guess um so if I, again if i'm seeing fish and i'm just not being able to get them on the troll um sometimes they're just keyed into hearing them them land and they run to the noise and so if you can get you know multiple people popping at the same time those tuners will key in and come straight to you um i've done it multiple multiple times especially in the spring and in the fall um but you can get really, really frustrated watching tunas eat flying fish and trolling around them. And they're just, they're not keyed into what you're doing because they're listening for that splash. And with all the wake coming off your boat and the sound of the engines, they're, they're just not interested in looking at that. Um, so big key, I, I'm going to say it multiple times, but big, big key, take popping rods, have poppers on board. Some, some trips that will save your entire day. And it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's a blast. Um, so any questions about popping or jigging? Um, yeah, actually, I mean, the, the popping I followed a little bit more just in this sense, in the sense of this question, and I know you addressed it, but I just want to make sure I'm following. So if, if you're trolling and looking and I'm, I'm thinking about the general audience that doesn't have the instincts or the time on the water is you. So if, if I'm, if I fancy jigging and I'm trolling, like, what is it that gives me confidence that I can switch over to it? Is that I've caught some fish and I've marked them all in the same area and or you're marking fish on the machine and or you're seeing bottom that you like. Like for Joe Blow, who is comfortable with trolling, as you pointed out, 90% is mm -hmm. what they're going to go to and they're just going to stay comfortable. But if we're trying to encourage them to try new things, mm -hmm. what's the best indicator that, hey, man, jigging might pay off for you? pull the rods, even though that's your comfortable, pull the trolling rods, even though that's your comfort. Okay. So again, jigging is going to require a target. First and foremost, you can jig with the best gear and have the most perfect form and not be where the fish are and not catch anything. And when you're drifting, you're not covering any water. So the, the main answer to your question is I need to have a target. So let's say I'm going to use the steeples again. I'm trolling around on the steeples and I'm getting some bites from tunas and I am also primarily marking them on the structure. Okay. Up in the water column somewhere from 150 foot and up typically below 150, it's going to be mixed in with jacks and other critters. Um, sometimes they are down that deep, but on a, on a more traditional scale, 150 foot or 125 foot and higher is where you want to mark them. Um, but you have to have a target to drop a jig to, um, you're, you're, and when I go back to that metered line, that's how you stay in that zone. So my metered line, I have, I use a couple of different kinds, but primarily it goes 25 or, or 10 meet 25 foot or 10 meters, which is 33 feet. And I can tell my clients, or if I'm dropping myself, I can say, okay, I'm marking these fish at X that's three colors. And I drop three colors 
and then I work it up from there and then go back three colors. Um, but you have to have a, a target to drop a jig to. Um, random drifting over the structure sometimes works. If they're spread out and they're on top, um, you know, the top 50 foot, you're not really marking them in big balls, but you're getting bit in a, in a certain area. You can drift that area and just drop, you know, three colors, four colors, keep it high enough so the jacks don't wear you out and, and jig. Um, but again, for me, I want to see a, a defined ball of fish uh, target. And, and that's how I, that's how I deem it's worth pulling out the jigging rods. Okay, man. Yeah. I think, I think, I guess my question, if I were to be able to re-ask it is like, do you have to catch fish to have confidence to go to the jigging? And, and you've answered that, like yeah. you're marking it, you're seeing what you want on the machine. I mean, catching doesn't hurt, but like marking on the machine. Hey, we're almost to a time. I'm going to ask you to give an abbreviated acknowledgement okay. of bottom fishing, and then we're going to thank you for your time. Yep. Okay. So, Again, May 1st, bottom, uh, grouper season opens. Um, don't leave. Uh, a lot of people leave the break to go bottom fish. You know, midday, if it's slow, they run inshore and bottom fish. All the structure that we're fishing offshore um, holds bottom fish. Uh, if, if, it, if it's an actual piece of rock or, or a piece of mud, it holds fish. Um, again, for me offshore, the number one bait is going to be a whole squid. Um, I use, I, I buy five pound boxes. Um, I rig them on a standard, for me, it's just a three-way swivel uh, bottom rig, about a three and a half foot leader, circle hook, a loop for your lead. Uh, I do use heavy leads in the Gulf Stream, so I'm usually using 20 ounces, and it's drift fishing because you're covering water. It's not like inshore where you're trying to anchor up and be on a piece of bottom, and, and you can add jigging in there, hit the, hit the bottom with the jig, don't take up any slack jig it high, let it, let it bounce off the bottom again. And, and as you drift, make sure you keep contacting the bottom. Um, that's pretty much, that's what I'll say about bottom fishing. Just don't leave the break. If you leave the break at noon, because for whatever reason, the fishing hasn't picked up yet or it's slow or whatever, uh, that water's moving and changing all the time. So if it changes at, at one o'clock and you've left at 12 to go bottom fishing in shore, you may miss the best part of the entire day. That happens a ton this time of year. And one more thing I'll, I'll say, having, having a couple of extra spinning rods, 20-pound, 30-pound spinning rods rigged up and ready to go, um, I like to have at least two rods, sometimes four rods, with little, this is a 6 aught circle hook, um, smaller circle hook than what you'd think because you can catch a whole lot of big fish on really small circle hooks. Um, and having squid, always, always, always take squid with you. And so a real quick way to rig a squid, you can actually slow troll this if a, like around a, uh, if there's a bunch of grass or if there's a, like a log or a target and you want to stop and try to fish it, um, you can slow troll this or you can pitch it. Um, just take a squid and look for the mantle. Take the hook, go through the tip of the mantle, okay, really close to the end, and pop the hook out, okay? And then spin the hook. So I go all the way in, and then I spin the hook. So I'm not going that far into the bait, and I'm coming back out of him. And watch what happens to the squid as I slide it back onto the hook. See how it goes straight again? You can actually troll this, and the mantle will keep the hook upright. So if you have a ton of grass and there's a bunch of fish in the area, but you can't really troll a traditional spread, you can take your spinning rods and, and squid from a five pound box. Thaw them out nice and good, rig them like this, and slow troll them across uh, that nasty grass and catch mahis and stuff. It's a great, it's a saver if you can't fish traditionally. I always have some spinning rods rigged up with um, circle hooks, and I always, always take squid, always. And then one other thing I wanted to show you is a bucktail. I always have bucktails on the boat. Um, I like these for jigging. This one is a, a, a blue or candy one with a blade on the back. You can also put a grub on the back of it, uh, three to five ounces. These catch everything. You can cast the targets. You can let it hit the bottom. Uh, it works the mid column. Every single thing out there will eat a, a bucktail. So another thing to have just in case everything else, you know, uh, if you need that option, it's nice to have it. Um. Rick Rosen, I'll tell you what impresses me right now is that I know we could have this conversation for three hours, but yet you have concisely and organizedly, that's not a word, presented 
May offshore playbook. I can't imagine someone doing a better job, man. I mean, so much information, a lot for us to unpack, maybe watch the episode a couple of times. As always, man, thanks for being a part of the Fisherman's Post community. Thank you so much for having me, Gary. It's been a, a great relationship. It has, man. Well, I'm going to go to David and wrap this thing up, but I'm already looking forward to next time. Thank you. That was so informative. <laughs> Wait, let me try that again. That was so informative. He had so much information. Oh, yeah. that could. I mean, we could have gone on and on. I mean, he could have gone on and on. Yeah, it's amazing. So, and, and I don't get to go out in the Gulf Stream. I've, I've like been out there a few times. Uh, but some of the best fishing I've ever had was been in the Gulf Stream. So I'm, I am fired up and ready to go. Um, I'm fired up and ready to go too. Like, yeah, talking about big fish, big targets, big water. Like it's hard not to get excited. Yeah, wahoo fishing. I went on a wahoo fishing trip one time and it was, the conditions were perfect, but that was like probably hands down, like the best fishing of like, of my lifetime. <laughs> was that on the Gulf Stream catching wahoo? Well, I'll tell you what you have to do. And this is a tough task is you have to come up with David's, singular i have to add that i have to add that clarification word after the other podcast david's singular best takeaway okay i have i have a few but i'm only going to mention one deal okay so this is you know in the beginning if you're going out in may like we've been talking about today you want a naked ballyhoo because everything eats them on a wire leader to keep your other fish from from breaking it off so i would be like if you're going off the Gulf Stream, just get as many ballyhoo as you can get together. Get some wire leader, troll them around, and see what's out there. Um, that's good. That's a good takeaway. I like that. And I didn't realize that either. I mean, I certainly am familiar with ballyhoo, but not that philosophy of singular, you know, or naked ballyhoo. What about what do we call it? What about the what about question? Like, if you had been me, what question did I not ask that you would have in this chair? I will have to think about that. Because he covered a lot of <laughs> so well, I have some. Oh, you have some. Yes, okay. because okay. this is going to be the jump start of our bonus the content. Bonus content, okay. And so, and again, he did a great job covering. But what I'm going to get him to talk about a little bit in bonus content is when you're jigging, what is the best action? What is the best retrieve method? How do you coach people to actually, you know, impart action on the jig and the retrieve? And then same question for the popper, because I remember being out there with him. I mean, I've caught my blackfin tuna with him on popper and saying, like, how long do you let it sit? Because if you're mimicking a flying fish, then you will, after the pop, after the land, you need to let it sit because that's what a flying fish does. So I want to see what, if anything, he's done to fine tune that process that he taught me years ago. Oh. Huh. So there, I, I did your job. Oh, well, I, I do have a question. Great about, partnership. I, yeah, I did your job. <laughs> you did a good job with it, too. <laughs> I, I don't got to just leave now. Well, how about <laughs> you thank our sponsors and we'll close this out. Yeah, we just want to thank uh, Port City Signs and uh, Marine Warehouse uh, for sponsoring the podcast. And again, if you've got an interest in sponsoring the podcast, uh, just contact the uh, Fisherman's Post. Yeah. And one other reminder, again, we are offering early release, um, early release of podcasts to members, to our weekly inshore fishing report members, as well as the bonus content, you know, only available behind the paid wall. But thank you so much for tuning into this podcast. And it feels so good to be back offering you the Saltwater Podcast Series.